good morning participants i request kindly mute yourself we are starting shortly in a few seconds Okay, so I guess we have enough of the participants to start up with. So, a very good morning and a warm welcome to all the participants for our webinar. As we all know, that is we Rio has started this Zoom weekend webinar series. So uh, today's webinar topic is based on cardiorespiratory physical therapy. Uh, so there's an announcement. I request all the participants, please stay muted throughout the webinar when the speaker is giving the talk so that there is no disturbance and we all will be able to understand. I also request if there are questions, you can post in the chat box here on the Zoom. It will be addressed later in the question answer session. So quickly, I will just go through the introduction of our today's speaker, Dr. Pramod Shirsagar. Dr. Pramod Shirsagar has done his bachelor's in from JN Medical College, Belgium, from 1996 to 2001. Then he did his master's in cardio cardiorespiratory physical therapy from SDM College of Physiotherapy, Dharwad which is affiliated to Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Science. After completing his master's, he's also done doctorate. He's doctor of PT, doctor of physical therapy from Winston Salem State University, North Carolina. Dr. Pramod Shirsagar has a experience of 11 years of teaching. He has done seven publications in national and international journals. He has also developed pulmonary rehabilitation program for home health agencies in USA. He was a former professor in and a PG guide in SDM College of Physiotherapy, Harvard. At present, Dr. Pramod Shirsagar is working as a physical therapist in California. So over to you, Dr. Pramod Shirsagar. I kindly request Dr. Pramod Shirsagar to start his screen share and take over. Hello, good morning, everyone. Mm. So, it's, uh, thank you for the introduction, Suraj. Uh, so, I thought of uh, coming with uh, this particular topic. So, this is uh, for COP patients. Uh, uh, 
when we when I was a home physical home health physical therapist in North Carolina, so I used to see so many patients uh, with COPD. They don't even know about the breathing exercises. Uh, plus, uh, they don't know any uh, airway clearance techniques. Uh, most of them, they don't aware. They're not aware about uh, how to use their inhalers, rotahalers, oxygenation. Uh, so that's why it came uh, in my mind. So something to make uh, this kind of uh, session for them, which is uh, the best place to do is uh, in their home because. Uh, unless like a patient with uh, cardiac surgery, you ask them to come to the second phase cardiac rehabilitation. So they are definitely come to the center and work with you. But these patients uh, have so many things going on, like they are on supplemental oxygen or shortness of breath uh, and lots of things going on. And these patients are also uh, very much uh, mm, susceptible for a hospitalization. Uh, so that's why today's topic will touch base with like some simple techniques to manage this patient at their home uh, or, um, you know, just to prevent the hospitalization risk. So moving on next. So as you all know, the pulmonary rehabilitation is a multi-dimensional continuum of services directed to the patients with pulmonary disease and uh, to their families, usually by interdisciplinary team of specialists with the goal of achieving and maintaining the highest level of independence and functioning in the community. So it's not only the physical therapist, there are so many people involved in this particular kind of a program usually the physician, pulmonologist, nurse, physical therapist, social worker, dietitian, exercise physiologist, and more. But not necessary to have all of them. So we can, uh, the team leader, usually the physician or pulmonologist, but if, 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 if you, in the absence of uh, all the team members, but the physical therapist or the nurse under the physician guidelines, can lead the program. So this is, uh, uh, but you should always be in touch with a physician uh, because they definitely need a uh, medication and uh, uh, the patient also require a supplemental oxygen. So the physical therapist cannot uh, uh, prescribe all those things. So, and plus they have so much ongoing uh, uh, disease process. So it is always, uh, better all these programs should be done under the supervision of a physician or the pulmonologist. Uh, moving on next, so for so the patient selection criteria for home, uh, for a, it should be a stable COPD patients uh, and uh, you should also take some relevant clinical history, check for whether they have uh, associated cardiac disease. Uh, why? Sir, simply sir, excuse me, sorry to yeah. Sir, have you started the screen share, sir? Yeah, I think, yeah, just a second. Yeah. yeah, yeah, please start the screen share because we are seeing your video on, on the main screen. Sir. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Please share the screen share. Yeah. Okay, cool. Can you see now? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Now, now we see. Okay, just a second. Okay, I'm sorry for that. So, but you have you heard those things, or should I start over? Sir, we were able to hear you clearly, and we thought that you were explaining things and oh, okay, okay, it's cool, quite cool, cool. quite enough uh, clear, sir. But okay. if you want to show the uh, slides, then it's okay, sir. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So again, just a uh, quick uh, review. So it's a pulmonary rehabilitation, multidimensional continuum of services directed to the patients with pulmonary disease and to their family, usually by the interdisciplinary team of specialists with the goal of achieving and maintaining the highest level of independence and functioning in the community. So like I said, the team members, uh, physician, pulmonologist, are usually the mm, team leader, or if in the absence of uh, the, um, all the team members, a PT or nurse can uh, effectively manage the, uh, the pulmonary rehabilitation program. 
So selection criteria. Um, so ideally, the the stage one COPD patients they will not be uh, much benefited with this because they uh, the disease symptoms are no not so much and um, they can be uh, managed without any kind of a pulmonary rehabilitation. But only the preventive or the education to the patient is very important than putting them for a pulmonary rehabilitation program. But definitely the type two and type three. Uh, patients with the COPD are um, definitely benefited with the uh, pulmonary rehabilitation, then why not uh, stage four? The stage uh, uh, four patients are, um, are on the, the palliative care or um, a terminal illness care. So it's like, a, it's a more of like a maintenance. So the physical therapist um, doesn't play much role in that. But if we are working in a palliative service, so, so definitely we can go for a, like a joint range of motion exercises, bed mobility, or caregiver education about the transfers, all those things we can work uh, if their patients are in the palliative care. But unless like if you are managing in the home, so it should be like a type uh, uh, level um, uh, on the severity basis, it's a stage two or stage three, um, COPD patients are benefited well. Uh, so always take the medication history and uh, rule out the cardiac disorder. Okay, so this is very important because um, some patients will also develop a core pulmonary or right heart failure, uh, which is due to the pulmonary uh, condition, uh, if it is a, like a chronic condition, or some patients also has a cardiac disease along with the COPD, um, many of the smokers. So it should always, it's always good to have uh, the background check. So the examination, like you all know, you do the general physical examination and the vital respira respiration rate, temperature, and SpO2. So you can, uh, I, my recommendation, like if you're working with a patient with a pulmonary disorder, so always to, uh, better to buy uh, the pulse ox, uh, pulse oximeter, so which uh, uh, you can buy it online, uh, like uh, on Amazon. Uh, so they are not uh, very expensive. So, and also it, it gives a very good, uh, when you are checking them, when you're working, uh, check the heart rate and the uh, oxygenation. So I usually uh, use that tool often during my practice. So it's always better to get a on pulse oximeter. Uh, and then, so you observe for a type of breathing and the accessory muscle work when you see the patient. So they are always uh, the patient with COPD, uh, they tend to use the accessory muscles. Uh, because of uh, the diaphragm is not effectively working. Uh, so there is an altered pattern of recruitment. Um, so usually the diaphragm is a chief muscle of uh, inspirator, inspiration. So where in this case, uh, the patient with COPD, they use uh, their thoracic uh, uh, muscles like uh, internal, uh, uh, sorry, external intercostal muscles more. Uh, so you don't see the uh, thoracic abdominal or abdominal thoracic breathing uh, that pattern is not you know, typically seen in patients with uh, advanced COPD. And always check uh, the patient uh, work for breathing, any increased NYHA dyspnea scale um, is always a good thing to use. Look for uh, jugular venous pressure. Is there any dilatation? And go for a palpation if there is any uh, sternum pain or osteochondritis because these patients cough a lot, so they usually have uh, uh, pain or, and then uh, rib fractures, uh, uh, elderly sp patients especially, uh, swelling or edema uh, to look for a CHF exacerbation. Uh, it's always good to have a practice if you're um, seeing them in a home. Uh, if they have uh, associated uh, heart condition, like a heart failure, uh, advise them to uh, check their weight every day. Uh, so this is a very good indicator. So you can prevent the hospitalization uh, because uh, what happens with the CHF, there is a fluid buildup. So that also the patient will uh, put a lot of uh, pressure on their um, uh, heart and the lungs so they cannot breathe. Uh, so any uh, increase in the weight. Uh, so what's the, uh, what you should advise is like um, check the weight in the, um, it's a dry weight. So it's with a minimal clothing is advisable. Uh, the patient go to the bathroom, uh, like a minimal dressing, so without eating or without drinking any water, so they check the weight. 
So anything more than three pounds um, is uh, is indicates that they they are fluid building up. So they have to contact their doctor because to change any uh, diuretics or any need for any hospitalization. So always check the weight if the patient is having a CHF and check for the less this is not so much important unless like it's a patient is associated with emphysema so there is increase in the uh, resonance otherwise uh, they, it's like you have any poor effusion and also that there is a dullness otherwise hyperresonance when there is a uh, emphysema but otherwise this is not the difficult to check okay so also check for any uh, crepitation uh, strider wheeze vesicular and bronco vesicular breathing, so whether it is normal or no. So typically they present with a wheeze. Uh, if there is a infection, so they will also present with a, a, a crepitations or crackles or the wrong kind. So uh, always check uh, uh, their uh, um, examine the auscultation. So each level individually and also the posterior. So most of the the lung is, you can hear the posterior aspect, uh, and then the anterior, most of your upper lobe can be heard better in the, when you're auscultating anteriorly. So most of the part of the lower lobe can be heard uh, when you auscultate posteriorly. Uh, so there are some uh, cool uh, video on the YouTube, which I want to share, how the crackle, wheeze, and uh, bronchi sounds like, okay? so this. for improvement. Hey everyone, this is Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com. In this video, I want to let you listen to six abnormal lung sounds, which will include wheezes, strider, crackles, and pore friction rub. This will be part of a review series of the lungs. Also, be sure to check out the video on normal lung sounds, as well as a lecture and skills demonstration, which is part of this series. So let's get started. Okay, thank you so much. That was the video about uh, some added sounds. So let's move on. Okay, so you also check for the sputum characteristic, the color consistency quantity of the sputum. So always check for whether it is, usually they have uh, clear, thin, or purulent, mucopurulent, hemoptasis, bright red with a frothy red color uh, sputum, and jelly type and rusty, and if it is checked for uh, the odor, if it is green, and 
increase in the quantity of the sputum indicates they have some infection. So always ask for that uh, history when during your visit or when the patient is with you. So they usually tend to get a uh, infection pretty fast because of the chronic illness. So, and the physical testing, like investigation, so what we have is uh, pulmonary function testing. So the simple way to test is uh, uh, the PEFR, peak expiratory flow rate, which is a handheld device which measures the velocity. As you all know, the patient with COPD has uh, the flow volume, uh, decrease in the flow volumes, that is your expiratory capacity. So the, the in inspiration curve looks normal, whereas the expiration uh, phase is affected because the airways tend to collapse during expiration. So the FE1 by FVC is decreased. Usually it is uh, 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 or 8, 70 to 80%. So in patient with COPD, it is decreased. And PEFR, is a simple handheld device, so which can measure the flow, the expiratory flow velocity. So that also will decrease. And maximal voluntary ventilation, it's a good tool for uh, find out the endurance of the respiratory muscles, and also check for flow volumes, loops and flows. So uh, especially in case of asthmatic bronchitis, there is a reversibility of the pulmonary function values after administration of bronchodilators, whereas in uh, emphysema and uh, chronic bronchitis, there is no reversibility. So that's a distinguishing feature between asthmatic bronchitis and chronic bronchitis. Okay, so maybe there's some studies tells the asthmatic bronchitis can turn into chronic bronchitis, okay? So because of the in ongoing inflammation, uh, okay, so Diva has raised her hand. So I don't know if she has any question. Uh, Diva, you can unmute. Actually, sir, we will keep the question answers in the okay. end, sir. Yes, sir? Okay. Yeah, yeah, so okay. that we finish the presentation and we can have an interaction in the end, sir. Okay, cool. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, I can see Akshay Kumar. Okay, cool. So, and also this patient with COPD has uh, the nutritional uh, management required because they are malnutrition. Seven, the study shows 17 to 52% of the patients have uh, malnutrition due to short of breath, medication side effects, due to increase in work of breathing. So they cannot eat well. So always your body has used more energy because of your, there is increased catabolism uh, because your accessory muscle work and they don't rest properly. So your body has used more energy to get enough air. So this can cause you to lose weight uh, so they have to go for five to six uh, small meals with a snack in between. Too much of food is one of the sitting effect breathing. So because of the diaphragm, uh, it will go for uh, insufficiency. The, the compliance will decrease, okay? The calorie for energy, so vitamins and minerals, advise take a health of uh, dietitian if possible. Or, but uh, as per the law, I mean, you can, as a physical therapist, we can, anyone can advise over the nutrition. Uh, so, like, good nutrition advice can be done by anyone. So, it's okay. So, you can advise if, if they have any knowledge about uh, nutrition. If not, then you can always recommend to consult a dietitian. And some of the foods to avoid, so you have, uh, I just mentioned here, so you can read. Uh, and then, uh, so many of the patients, this is a very uh, nice uh, information I'm sharing here. So there is a um, use inhalers.com. So you have uh, 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 
Akshay, can you uh, close your uh, video? Because it's distracting me. Akshay Kumar. Okay, so, <clears throat> so, uh, so you use inhalers.com. So you have, uh, so it's uh, like a, you can use in your own language. So just look for that uh, video. पत्र के तल पर अपने सूच कान कंस्तर के शीर्ष पर उंगली और अंगूठे रख कर मजबूती श्वसन यंत्र पकड़ो चरण चार सीधे बैठे जा खड़े हो जाओ चरण पांच वापस थोड़ा अपने सिर को झुका चरण छह दुर्श्वसन यंत्र से सांस छोड़ दे चरण सात आपके मुंह में श्वसन यंत्र रखो श्वसन यंत्र बाएं और एक ही समय में सांस लेने लगते हैं एक धीमी और गहरी सांस ले चरण आठ दस सेकंड के लिए अपनी सांस पकड़ो आपके मुंह या नाक के माध्यम से धीरे धीरे सांस छोड़ दे एक और खुराक आवश्यक है तो दोहराए तीस सेकंड के बाद दो अब दोहराए आप एक कॉटिकोस्टेरॉइड दवा का उपयोग कर रहे हैं तो सभी खुराक पूरी हो जाने के बाद अपना मुंह गुल्ला So that was just an example how to use so use you can use this uh, website like use inhalers.com and you can have a, on your android or ios device you can download and show to the patient if you want and, or you can advise the patient also to download and use it okay so next is uh, how do you classify the copd is to be remember i told you so it's for uh, uh, the patient with moderate and severe copd but not for very severe and the mild because mild they don't need a, um, a physical therapy intervention or the very severe so they will not be benefited because the volumes uh, are uh, the, they are they are greatly affected and they are terminally ill so they they need a palliative care rather than the regular one so they will not be in the home so the role of uh, physical therapist is not so much so you you just remember this like a mild copd if he even values like more than equals to 80% and this one if he one in moderate a copd is more than equals to 50 to 80% so it's never less than 80 50 so the the severe is more than 30% but less than 50 and very severe is less than 30% so they need a invasive ventilator or oxygenation so as a physical therapist uh, you have a very simple tool that's a ventilator response index you can use this tool during your clinical practice so great objective tool is for uh, quantify the breathlessness have a patient count between 1 to 15 in 8 seconds so count the number breath in one so how many breaths they take when they count so 
according to that, you can categorize them, you can quantify them, zero, one, two, three, four. So zero, you can, they can count in without taking any additional breath. So in one breath, they can count. And this one, they take one breath in between. Two means two breath in between to count 15. And three is they take three. And four is that they take four breaths to count 15. So this is very important. Just, you can use this. Okay, so access viability of diaphragm. So this is a very simple technique. So you can uh, place your hand in specified process, ask them to sniff three times. You should be able to feel the diaphragm contract underneath your fingers if the diaphragm is viable. So mostly they tend to use the thoracic cage muscles. So it's hard to find that so that's why there is a role of uh, first the breathing exercise and the diaphragmatic breathing exercise incorporated in the treatment sessions. So the airway clearance, very important to prevent airway collapse and pneumonia, preventing frequent hospitalization. So you can do the, uh, we are not using a tilt board in the patient's home or patients with COPD, it's not uh, practically advisable because patient have short of breath, they cannot tolerate the tendon position. So what I found was the, the modified postural drainage uh, position is very effective. So we can grossly put them in under prone position, placing a pillow underneath and just go for a timing how they can tolerate. Maybe you can start with one or two minutes and increase up to five to 10 minutes because uh, the postural drainage, what recommended is like 50 to 20 minutes, they have to be in one position. So this is like a, using a tilt board, but we don't have the tilt board in the patient's home. So they can just use the pillows or the, uh, the paper or the chair. They can position themselves. Okay, so mostly the COPD is affect, affects like your lower lobes. So the prone position uh, is advisable to increase, uh, improve the ventilation and perfusion ratio also to clear airway secretions. And you can also advise the caregiver to apply a percussion if they are well to do that or if you are a physical therapist uh, in their home treating or if, if, if the patient comes to you, if you're seeing them in the clinic or the hospital, when they are in the postural drainage position, you apply percussion shaking or vibration or any uh, chest manipulations to uh, clear the airway secretions or uh, just time uh, the treatment with the nurse. Uh, if they give a nebulization with any mucolytic agents, so it's always favorable time to give your chest physical therapy soon after they done with that treatment. So this is the classical uh, thing, like we're choosing a tilt board. So uh, increase the, uh, the raise the foot end and patient in prone position. So for the, the bronchopulmonary segment, which is draining is close to your lobe. Uh, so, uh, why we are doing a airway clearance? What is the concept behind it? So, we all know there are 23 uh, generation uh, bronchopulmonary segments. So, uh, when you see, so there is a SNR airway and conducting airways. So, if, if the secretion is two way, beyond the conducting airway. So by coughing or huffing, you cannot able to bring the secretion out. So the role of physical therapist is to get the secretion till the conducting airway that's around 13 to 14. So then if the patient go for coughing or huffing, they can easily clear the secretion. Uh, this is again some of the postural drainage, sorry, yeah, postural drainage things which you can apply. Uh, so again, I think you all know about uh, percussion, so I'll not waste my time in putting a video, but you can just, uh, when I send my PowerPoint, so you can just look for the link which I'm playing. So, and so next is, uh, this is the cough phases. So ch check, I mean, the evaluation of cough is very important in patient with uh, restrictive lung disease, like example, spinal cord injuries or muscular dystrophy. But in patient with COPD, the cough is not much affected. But you should 
tell, teach them about the huffing. So the huffing is forceful expiration against the open glottis, whereas cough is forceful expiration against the closed glottis. So look for all these phases. Okay, so this is not usually affected in cases with COPD. So we are not bothered much about it. But so also incorpor incorporate the breathing exercises. So the rational is increase the ventilation could stimulate pulmonary stretch receptor as well as receptor in the upper airway resulting in increased vagal activity. This increase in parasympathetic activity is expected to speed a clearance probably due to augmented mucus secretion. So the breathing exercise also helps in clearing the airway secretions. So evidence-based practice suggests physical therapy is effective in mucus clearance, but effect each treatment are moderate and long-term benefits are unproven. Manually assisted cough, expiratory muscle weakness is indicated, like expiratory muscle weakness in elderly people or patients with uh, some neuromuscular disorders. Huffing is uh, autogenic drainage or urgent. So like I said, um, the patient uh, cough a lot, so that will also causes airway collapse. So hence, huffing is better over the coughing. Mechanical uh, cough assist also can be tried. So these are all grade C uh, evidence. Uh, PEP is a good cause to expiratory pressure. We are going to see that in upcoming slides. So very important. So you can, it has a good evidence in clearing the airway secretions. So newer methods like a positive expiratory pressure, flutter valve, a capella, high frequency chest wall oscillation, intrapulmonary percussive ventilator. So the breathing strategies like autogenic drainage. So the autogenic drainage, ED is like a, it's a self drainage uh, technique, which was uh, Chevalier in 1960. So these are, these are the phases which has an unsticky phase, collecting phase and evacuating phase. So each phase you have like two to three minutes with a, the full cycle taking six to nine minutes. This is, uh, but it's like a more of a, uh, if the patient is uh, uh, really willing to do that, so you can try it. Uh, but in my practice, uh, so they feel it's really hard to perform. So, but see this, this is the normal because they have to breathe um, below the tidal volume. Like when you are, when they are doing a, like unsticky and collecting phase, so they are breathing in the, below the tidal volume, like a really small breaths, which is not possible in patient with uh, dyspnea. So you can just watch this video. So there is, a, you can also like, you all can browse it, so. Sure you're well hydrated and to cover water and drink until you feel that your throat is nice and moist. Afterwards, get a tissue and blow your nose. This is a very slow, long nose breath out that's quiet. It is not a loud breath. Once you feel your nose is clear, you can move on to the breathing technique. During this technique, place one hand onto your chest and one hand onto your stomach. This is to ensure when you take the breath in, you firstly breathe into the stomach before expanding into the chest. After the breath in, you're looking to relax the mouth for an inaudible, relaxed breath out. During this breath out, you're looking to breathe out as far as possible. You're also looking to hear a level of where the crackle might be. This is an indication of where sputum is. After the long breath out, take a very small breath in and then breathe out. Take a small breath in and breathe out. You're now breathing into the low volumes of your lungs. Once you feel that the sputum or the crackle sound has started to move higher, you can then start to increase the breath in and a very small breath out. This then moves your breath to the middle of your lungs. You're then looking to take a slightly larger breath in to then move up to the top of your lungs. Take a small breath out and a long breath in. 
Once you feel you've got to the top of your lung, you may feel that you need to cough. At this point, you can take two coughs. <coughs> Try and limit it to two coughs to avoid any trauma to the lung. If you manage to cough and clear, you can return back to the chest breath to see if there's any more sputum or crackle sound on the chest. If so, repeat the cycle. Okay guys, so that was the video and I can also recommend you guys uh, uh, when you are with patients if you have uh, like any smartphone or the laptop or tablet so always just show them a YouTube link so they can practice uh, when you are not there or when they come to your clinic you can show them so that's what I do and so now we are so this is active cycle of breathing technique. This is a very uh, effective uh, treatment in clearing the airway secretion. So it has uh, three phases, breathing control, thoracic expansion, and force techniques. So it was uh, been uh, uh, developed by Weber et al. You can see uh, it, it increases the, uh, without increasing hypoxia and patients with uh, uh, airflow obstruction you cannot perform easily doing this technique so which I commonly practice this so uh, so take a deep breath emphasizing inspiration so what is the rational behind thoracic expansion is like uh, deep breathing emphasizing inspiration so inspiration is combined with a three second hold before the exhalation and the inspiratory hold is said to be uh, affecting your, so you have uh, uh, enhanced the collateral, so you have uh, interlobal, interbronchial channels of Martin, bronchial uh, alveolar channels of Lambert, and force of cones which connects the alveoli. So you are facilitating um, the collateral ventilation. Okay, so this is uh, the rational behind uh, your deep breathing. Okay, so there is also uh, called as alveolar interdependence. So, for example, if it is some group of alveolar are affected, you take a deep breath and hold for three seconds. What happens is the adjacent alveoli will also stretch the collapsed alveoli. So that's why it's called as alveolar interdependence. They are connected to each other. So you want to help them. Okay, so then the force expiratory techniques like a huffing or coughing uh, after when you do all this thing, uh, you are moving a equal pressure point, so you can open the airways and clear the airway secretions. So instead of uh, going, so you, you can go for breathing control, then thoracic expansion three to four. Again, you can come back to breathing control. Then you can go for thoracic expansion and breathing. You can you can tailor made uh, this if, if the patient has a lot of breathlessness. You can go for uh, uh, breathing control, more of breathing control. Then at the end, uh, end with the force expiratory technique like coughing or coughing uh, can be done. Uh, so I can also show you a video of that. stomach on the breath in. If you find this is cycle of breathing technique, it is a three phase cycle. The first phase is breathing control. Place your hand on your stomach and take a relaxed breath in through your nose and a relaxed gentle breath out through your mouth. You want to be looking not to expand into the chest to expand into the stomach on the breath in. If you find on the breath out it is difficult with an open mouth, you may prefer a pursed lip breath. Repeat this five times. After the fifth, move on to phase two, thoracic expansion exercise. Here, place your hands onto your ribcage. Take a 
take a longer, deeper breath in through the nose. And then open the mouth and take a gentle, long breath out through the mouth. During this phase, you're looking to get the movement of the ribs out, like so. And then come back in again on the breath out. Again, on the breath out, if you find it difficult with an open mouth, press your lips together and this will make it easier. After the fifth, you can either go back to phase one, the breathing control, or move on to phase three, the fourth expiratory technique. Here, you can mimic steaming up a window or mirror by using your hand. You take a long breath in through the nose and then open the mouth to huff out. If you feel you can do it without using the visual aid of your hand, the practice. You can do it by taking a smaller breath in through the nose and a longer huff out through the mouth, or a longer breath in through the nose and a short, quick huff out through the mouth. At this point, you may feel the need to cough and clear. <coughs> Sir, sir, unmute yourself, sir. Unmute yourself. Yeah, now, now you can. Just check, sir. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, now clear. Now you can. Okay. So, you can go for a flutter, so which is a very simple handheld device. So, it works on the principle of uh, vibration, high density stainless steel ball, and uh, you can. Uh, breathe out through this and throughout the expiration phase the high density stainless steel uh, ball vibrates and send a uh, vibratory forces back to your airway that helps in leading your airway secretion so vibrate the airway the based on the ability to vibrate the airway intermittently increase the endobronchial pressure accelerate expiratory flow so the, the flutter produces a range of oscillation frequency between 6 and 20 hertz, which is corresponds to the range of the pulmonary resonance frequency in the humans. So this also, uh, because unless like a ACBT or autogenic tra drainage, you need uh, some training or feedback for the patient or teach back method has to be done. Uh, but these devices, if, if you teach them one or two times, the patient will be really comfortable doing this because it's not uh, like, uh, unless like those two techniques, there is any particular sequence. Uh, so uh, the patient with the pneumothorax, especially uh, if there is a emphysema, there is a, you think the, the patient has emphysema display and that might rupture, so don't advise this thing to them. Okay, and uh, the position of the patient is very important now when you are mm, advising the uh, the device okay so we have also the the video of that which is To clean the device, you need to take all the different out and wash it in warm soap and water at least once a day, or after every use if you can do, which is more ideal. And then, so wash it in warm soap and water, give it a good shake, and let it air dry. When it's dry, I'll put that together with a cup going to search the ball, and then twist the lid on the top, and then firm and twist. And so it's going to be used in one of two positions, either sitting upright or forward leaning over a table, and I'm going to show you both. The first one, I'm going to start with. To teach from the how to use it. First of all, you can take a medium sized breath in, hold it for two or three seconds, 
pop the cutter in your mouth, ensuring it's a nice flat horizontal position, and then breathe out at a fast but not too forceful speed. When you get to wonderful expiration or breathing out, stop, take a breath back in, and just get your breath back, and then repeat that again. So, medium sized breath in, pop it in your mouth, and breathe out. You should be able to hear that rattle of the ball in the cup. What you can do in this position is change the position of the club test, either make it slightly easier or slightly harder. But what you need to remember to do is need to remember that that ball in the cup is how this device works. So if you tip it too far forward, it won't work for you and you'll hear that and you might feel a bit of concern. So to up with this time, so medium size breath in. Secondly, taking it down as desired. Okay, so that was about flutter, so you can can watch the video when you would like if you need some more information so you can just watch because there are thousands of videos in YouTube but I just pick the one which is best and which explains the things better uh, so so like I explained everything so fluttering effect is a pep therapy which is an oscillating uh, device which has a positive expiratory uh, pressure breathing of uh, 10 to 20 centimeter of water. Uh, patient exhales through the fixed orifice. Uh, so this is how it looks in the PEP device. So, and this is, it can be a, uh, can be two types when it's, uh, you have, you can apply to the nose, like a mask, or you can, you can use it like a mouthpiece. So, there are also videos because of the short of time I'm not showing, but you can just, when you get a PowerPoint, you can look that. Uh, so the, and also there is one upcoming thing. Uh, these days there is something called as Vibra PEP, so which is most uh, uh, beneficial. Uh, I went through some of the devices, so that there is something called as Vibra PEP. So you can also advise uh, that thing to the patient. So this is all instructions like uh, patient but the, the, the very important thing is you have to set the pressure between 10 to 20 centimeter of water. Okay, so, uh, and also at, during any of this, uh, uh, the PEP or flutter or acapella, you want to ask the patient to cough or hop to clear the airway secretions at the end. So this is the acapella, which is, uh, it has a feature of uh, PEP, and the vibratory uh, feature of uh, flutter. So you, it's like a two in one, so it comes in two variants. It's a green and the, uh, the blue according to the resistance offered. So it's like a small handheld device that combines the resistive feature of PEP valve and the vibratory feature of uh, the flutter valve to mobilize the secretions in the airway. Uses the counterweighted plug and magnet, directs the exhale, the air through pivoting cone to generate airflow vibrations between zero to 30 Hertz. So both vibration frequencies and resistive pressures, uh, resistive pressures are adjustable. So you have uh, this device, so you can adjust, there is a, there is a clear cut mark which you can increase the resistance by rotating that. Okay, so this is just a quick video about that. And because we are almost finishing our uh, slideshow, Only to be used following assessment and advice from your physiotherapist. The acapella is an airway clearance technique. It has two parts. Firstly, a resistance part with a resistance dial from one to five. Secondly, vibratory plates inside that vibrate on the breath out. You can use this device inside lying or sitting up. Pass the acapella to your patient starting on a low resistance. Allow the patient to take a breath in through their nose and then breathe out through the acapella. You can repeat the acapella for several cycles until the patient feels they need to cough and clear. The 
If it is an effective with a low resistance, you can increase the resistance. Okay, so that was the video about uh, acapella. And uh, the good thing about acapella is you can also uh, apply a medication through that so the patient can breathe or the mucolytics can be attached to this uh, acapella. Uh, so, so always check for uh, outcomes, change in the sputum production, change in the breath sounds, patient subjective response to the therapy, change in the vital signs, change in the x-ray, change in the uh, atrial, arterial blood gas uh, values of the oxygen saturation, especially if you're working in the intensive care unit, so they tend to do the ABGs and the x-ray frequently, so you can always check them. And vital signs, so in any setup you work, so check, auscultate patient's lung or check for the basic SpO2 levels, which is the very basic one. Uh, the subjective response is very important. So always check about their, how do they feel when they exercise. So, so always select the appropriate bronchial hygiene therapy there because I've mentioned several. There are still some more, but which I just picked, uh, which is uh, commonly practiced. So you select which one is best for the patient and uh, advise them because it has to be a individualized approach. There is no uh, set protocol for the patient. So you have to select which one is effective. Uh, and the patient have a caregiver, which is very important. And always uh, advise them for a smoking cessation. Uh, and what are the outcome and the cost? So you, if you uh, advise uh, high frequency chest wall oscillation, so which costs more, and uh, which is uh, not needed and the patient cannot afford, so ignore. But the PEP, acapella, and all, so they are usually on the affordable range. Or the incentive spirometer, which is very important, so you can also um, do them. That, and if the patient willing to buy uh, acapella, bladder, or vibra PEP, so it's always recommended. I'm always talk to the doctor about your recommendations. So, very important aerobic training. So it should be low intensity, unsupported upper limb exercises because it's it showed very beneficial in uh, in the literature when they use it. And also you can use uh, the walking static bike exercises, which is aerobic form, like uh, frequent uh, three to five days a week. Intensity of 60 to 70 percent of pivo to max and uh, RPE of uh, 12 to 13. So work scale of pursued exertion, so it is from zero to 20 scale. So when they exercise in the moderate, that is 12 to 13, so they feel that moderate intensity, especially the patient who are on the beta blockers. You cannot use as a heart rate as a, uh, to, to check the intensity. Uh, so you should check uh, the subjective pursued exertion, that is 12 to 13 is the range or uh, one more thing I would like to say. So it is, starts from six to 200. So you know what is that? So it always correlates to the heart rate. So very, very, very minimum. So it's like a 60 heart rate, okay? And the moderate is between 120 to 130 heart rate. So it always correlate indirectly to your heart rate, okay? So it's very, very hard the heart rate of 180 to 200, it's a severe intensity exercise. So work scale of uh, pursued exertion is very good too. The physical therapist can use the subjective pursued exertion, special patient with hypertension, patients with uh, hy uh, diabetes on beta blockers, uh, and plus patient with on the hypertension with on the beta blockers. So the, the, the beta blockers blunt the heart rate response. So hence, uh, uh, the patient will not, if you check the intensity using the heart rate formula, MHR, 
or Carowinds formula or heart rate reserve formula. So you cannot actually tell like how the patient is exerting. So you always use one of the RPE, one is subject, one subjective and objective measure. So usually better is aerobic walking. So every, uh, and every visit you please check medication reconciliation, whether they have taken the medication or no. And always give us, advise them for a strict adherence because patients uh, tend to overuse the medication during exacerbation and then they underuse them otherwise or they don't take it otherwise. So advise about yearly flu vaccine and pneumococcal pneumonia vaccine two to three years as per the physician recommendation. Do not over uh, use the do not use the drug uh, drug overuse the drug during exacerbation. So do not underuse the medication when you have, don't have any symptoms. So smoking suggestion, nutrition management, disease mm -hmm. management, education. So one important uh, thing I would like to sh share with you is uh, there is something called as uh, uh, the ATS uh, info. So if you can, uh, American Thoracic Socia Society, just click www.ats.patientinfo. So you, you can you can check like whatever you want to print. So uh, like, for example, surgery for COPD. So they will explain you why there is a surgery and all. So this is a patient information can be uh, provided by the American Thoracic Society. So it's ATS has that tool. So this is for your uh, information. So you can you can use it. Uh, and next, so yeah, that's about it. So mostly you can look for look for aerobic exercises, airway clearance, and breathing exercises. So over to you, Suraj, if, have, if they have any questions. Fantastic, sir. Fantastic. It was an amazing talk. Thank you so much. Uh, thank thank you. you. I'm sure all of our participants have got a detailed overview and clear picture about pulmonary rehabilitation and home program management in chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. I would take the opportunity to thank you, uh, our speaker. Uh, but before that, uh, let's let's just have a few questions, sir. I, I think there are a couple of questions, sir. Okay. On Zoom. Okay. There is one question, sir. I would like to know about any recent advances other than percussion and tapping to clear the chest secretion. Yeah, that's what I just mentioned. All those things they can you, they can use um, these uh, techniques like uh, active cycle of breathing technique, autogenic drainage, or there is a Vibra PEP, which is very important. They can browse Vibra PEP, so which uh, has a very important uh, um, tool to uh, clear airway secretion, sir. So they uh, and uh, those are like a conventional techniques. You give a just percussion, vibrations, shaking. Uh, so those are the, um, like no, we don't apply all three in a patient, but it uh, it is, it depends which one, uh, like I say, like it's an individualized program. Uh, like if you ask about um, recent advances in percussion, there are, uh, to my um, knowledge, uh, there are no much uh, change for um, uh, manual, uh, percussion, but you can apply these devices. If the patient is having a chronic condition, you can go for a um, high frequency chest wall oscillation device, which without using any manip manipulation, the patient can put a, the vest and it can apply a vibration. Yes. Okay. Sir. That question was asked in the very beginning and after that, maybe you mentioned all the recent advances, sir. There are, there are a couple of more questions. I'll take questions, sir. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So when can the aerobic exercises can be started for the patient? Is there any particular protocol, sir? No, not really. But uh, it's it's actually uh, uh, if the patient it doesn't mo most of the patient doesn't have uh, like a secretions uh, on on the regular basis. But uh, during the uh, exacerbation, uh, so you, uh, you can uh, decide your intensity. Uh, so you can go for a low intensity exercises or you can give them a rest. 
but uh, check your oxygen saturation and uh, check if the patient is having a fever or any exacerbation. So they need a hospital treatment, not your like a physical therapy. So that time there is no role of aerobic exercise. But the, when the patient is stabilized, so it's a, that's the time when you it's a, it's a good to use the aerobic exercise. So I given the intensity. Uh, so more of uh, the stationary bike or the walking. Uh, so those kind of exercises or simple low and un, un, uh, unsupported uh, upper extremity exercises are uh, beneficial when they are in ex uh, in dyspnea or like severe um, form of uh, uh, like a, when they need a hospitalization. So that time you don't uh, you know give uh, them any aerobic exercises. Suraj. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, yes, sir. I did not unmute myself. What is the best time of the day for the therapy, sir? Question. Yeah. But, uh, mostly these patients uh, tend to have a lot of secretions in the morning. Uh, so you can uh, time yourself in the mornings, always advisable. Uh, but there is no uh, as such uh, set of uh, therapy timing. Uh, if they, Because most of these patients are they don't sleep well in the night because of the uh, breathing difficulty. So you can always talk to the patient and they just ask them which time is better. But if they are in the hospital, it's always better if, in my recommendation. So when they give uh, any nebulization therapy or any immune therapy, mm -hmm. so that's the time you can uh, coordinate with the nursing staff and uh, go on that time. So that uh, is advisable. But otherwise, um, yes. you can talk to the patient if they are not, if they are in the home. Yes. So I guess that that's all in the Zoom chat box, sir. Uh, okay. I will just ask Dr. Hiral if there is any question on Facebook or YouTube. Okay. 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 So that's all, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Okay. Uh, Pramod. Thank you, uh, thanks a lot. We, we had a really amazing uh, talk and it is really great to hear this in this situation as, as we all are uh, well versed that uh, how uh, physical therapy, cardiorespiratory and pulmonary, physio pulmonary rehabilitation is helping in this situation. There is a need of understanding it in detail. So this talk, sir, definitely gave us an overview altogether concise in one presentation, sir. Thanks and plus, uh, one, one last uh, note, uh, when you apply any chest physical therapy technique for a COVID patient, so there is a limited research on it, uh, you have to be very much uh, taking caution about the, the droplet and airborne precautions. So these techniques are directly affecting the physical therapist also. So you should, you should always consult some uh, your physician or, uh, or go through the literature uh, before you apply these techniques to any patient because uh, yes. uh, the literature support and all has to be very important, right? Definitely. 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 All right, then. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll take the uh, take the pleasure of thanking our team prior also, Dr. Hiral Jain and Dr. Alisha Loda, our okay. technical support, Mr. Krish. And thanks a lot again, all the participants to join us here. And we look forward for uh, further such informative meetings and talks in future. Okay. Thanks thank a lot, you. sir. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Bye. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night. Good night.